Hey, how's it going, everybody? It's your boy, Delightful Kiss Boy, and I've got a very fun video for you today. I'm going to be using an army of bots that I've trained to play various casino games to make a tier list that tells you what the best forms of gambling are and what the worst forms of gambling are. I'm going to be analyzing the games, explaining how they work, crunching some numbers. It's going to be a lot of fun, so stick around. If you like this kind of stuff, consider subscribing. You know, I'm going to make more videos like this in the future. Let's go. So, let me explain how this works, all right? I have an army of 100,000 little bots, and I'm going to give them $1,000 per game that they play, and they're going to take that money, and they're going to go into the casino, and they're going to start gambling. Now, they're going to keep playing these games until they've used all the money up, and hopefully they're going to win me big bucks, baby. And they're going to bring that money on back to me. And I'm going to give them the thumbs up. And I'm going to go ball out myself with all the profits we make. Because I'm pretty sure that's how gambling works, right? You just win. So the gambling strategy that the bots are going to take is they're going to start off with $1,000 of bankroll per game that they're playing. Okay? What they're going to do is they're going to make $20 flat bets using that bankroll. Uh, so in this case, he's playing slots. He puts a $20 bet on slots. And then in this case, he wins 40 bucks off of the $20 bet. What the bot's going to do is he's going to take $20 of that uh, win and put it back in the bankroll to replace the bet that he just made. He's going to take the 20 extra dollars of profit that he has. He's going to put it in the winnings pile. All right. Now what he's going to do is he's going to keep gambling until he depletes all of his bankroll. And then we just look at the winnings pile and we see what the profit was. I'm going to come out of the void and yeet those winnings away because they're my, they're my winnings. All right. These bots, they don't do anything except serve me. Okay. I've also taken the liberty of, of naming each bot just to kind of, you know, establish that personal connection. And in this case, Tim here only won me 20 bucks, which is pitiful. So I'm going to be uh, damning Tim to an eternity of punishment. All right, but uh, in reality, what we're really doing here is we're just uh, using code. So I've written a bunch of code to play all these different games. Um, we're looping through them and using some different strategies to play these games, which I'll explain as we get to those games. But uh, what you can do is you can go into the description. I'll have a link to my GitHub page. It'll have all of the code there, which you can take a look at, play around with. Just to note, it's a little messy. I was just kind of throwing it together. You know, I just wanted this shit to work so there's not a lot of comments and stuff. But feel free to look through it, download it, play around with it. You know, crunch the numbers yourself. Now, there is one caveat to that. Uh, I am not including the video poker code in the repo. I'm going to be deleting that code uh, for one very important reason. It's that I'm completely ashamed of it. It's complete dog shit code that uh, is totally messy, all right? I mean, it got the job done, but uh, I'm totally ashamed of it. So I'm going to be taking that code, I'm going to be putting it in a blue barrel, like, you know, like what serial killers use. I'm going to be dumping some hydrofluoric acid in there to dissolve the code, and then I'm going to seal it up, go out in the middle of the ocean, and dump it in the water, all right? Sink it to the bottom of the ocean. Nobody needs to see this code. It's disgusting. It's deplorable. Um, maybe I'll go back and fix it up, clean it up to something that I'm proud of and then update my repo if there's enough demand for it. But for now, just look at the other code. Don't worry about it. All right. We don't need to play video poker. No big deal. Anyway, let's, let's go over uh, what our starting money is going to look like. All right. I'm going to track this as we play various games. We're going to see how it, you know, waxes or wanes after big wins, baby. So the starting money, okay, we have 100,000 bots, and they're each going to play seven games. Each bot gets $1,000 to gamble per game. So that means Daddy DKB's got to put up $700 million to do this. All right, so let's bring in the money here. All right, pay no attention to the fact that, I, that most of these are, I think, euros. Uh, when I made the slide, I uh, made the giant pile of cash, and then I realized afterwards... Oh, those aren't American dollars, which is a little bit awkward, but uh, we just roll with it, baby. Uh, don't worry about it, okay? Um, honestly, if you're perturbed by this, that's a you problem. But uh, here's our here's our big old pile of cash, and we're going to see how this depletes over time. We got those Bezo bucks, baby. 
So uh, let's uh, let's go into my gambling history just before we get started, just so you get a feel of where I'm at and my position on gambling. Uh, so let's start. The first time I actually gambled in, uh, you know, in full. I bought one lotto ticket when I turned 18 just because I could. You know, it's, that's the legal age with which you can buy a lottery ticket. And uh, after I got it, I didn't even check to see if I won because I just figured, hey, I probably haven't because it's so unlikely that I won anything. It was mostly just a symbolic gesture. I've never bought a lottery ticket other than that time. And I still have that ticket sitting in a drawer somewhere. Uh, I've done some minor bets with friends, like uh, betting on different, you know, sports games or whatever. One that comes to mind is the McGregor versus Mayweather fight. Uh, I had this friend who was just adamant that uh, McGregor was going to win, and I was like, there's no fucking way, dude. So I took him up on that bet, and uh, obviously I won, okay? Easy money, easy money. Uh, other than that, I, I like to, you know, gamble degenerately in video games because there's no consequence. If you see me play Buckshot Roulette, I just send it every fucking time, buddy. High risk, high reward. But uh, that's about it. I actually don't really gamble IRL. I, I've never played any casino games in a casino. I'm just not into it, you know. It just seems kind of stupid and pointless to me personally. Um, yeah, I'm a perfect little angel. But uh, why am I making this video then? Well, first of all, it's funny. It's just fun to talk about, entertaining, you know. It's interesting because I like analyzing, you know, various games. Probab games of probability, games of chance, all sorts of stuff like that. Also, like, I just, who doesn't love a good tier list? It's just funny and interesting. All right, man? Um, this is actually low-key an anti-gambling video, all right? Now, I'm not going to get up here and morally grandstand about the virtues of, you know, not gambling, etc., etc. You do you. You do whatever the hell you want. I mean, it's like, I'm not going to tell you to not do it. If you want to do it, go ahead and do it. Just be informed, right? People are going to gamble anyway, so you might as well be informed about it, right? I have the same philosophy when it comes to drugs. People know that they're not supposed to be taking drugs, but they do it anyway because they like doing it, right? And who am I to get in their way? All I'm saying is be informed, right? I'm going to present some numbers to you. If your takeaway is that you don't want to gamble, great. That's what I want you to take away. But if you're still going to do it, at least know which ones are, you know, which forms are better than others, right? I'm not your mommy. I'm not your daddy. Just do you, all right? But uh, before we get started, I got to cover a couple of terms, all right? Just so you understand what I'm doing through the video. If you already know how this shit works, feel free to skip ahead. No big deal, NBD. Uh, let's cover expected value, all right? Expected value is the average outcome for a game in this context, all right? It's basically like what you would expect to make um, if you play the game over and over again for an extended period of time, okay? It's the average value of, of some probabilistic outcome, okay? Variance is essentially how much the game tends to deviate from that expected value, all right? So if you have a larger variance, it means that the um, basically the, the spread of the outcomes is going to be greater, right? So it's more random, you could think of it, more unpredictable if there's a higher variance. Lower variance means that you're going to get closer and closer to that average value, all right? Now, we're going to cover what a fair bet is, and we're also going to cover what a house edge is. So let's start off with a fair bet. A fair bet is a bet with an expected value of $0. You're not going to expect to gain any money, you're not going to expect to lose any money. It's just going to be, you know, you're expecting to break even, essentially. So participants are going to lose and they're going to win proportional to the risk that they're taking with the bet. So let's look at an example. If you flip a coin, if you flip a coin and if you get heads, you win a dollar, you get tails, you lose a dollar. Both outcomes, they're equally likely and the gains and the losses are equal to each other, right? So this is a completely fair bet. You know, it's 50-50 if you're going to lose a dollar versus win a dollar. It comes out to zero, expected value zero. However, here's another example. You spin a spinner. 25% of the time, you're going to win $12. 75% of the time, you're going to lose $4, all right? So this is actually how you compute expected value. You take the, um, the magnitude of the first outcome, which is $12, and you multiply it by the chance of it happening, which is 25%. And then you add it to 
the magnitude of the second outcome multiplied by the chances of it happening. So in this case, you lose $4, hence the negative 4, times the 75% chance of it happening. If you total this up, the first one equals $3, the second one equals negative $3, you add those together and you get 0. So in this case, the outcomes, they're not equal in magnitude, but the losses and gains are proportional to their likelihood. It all comes out to zero, all right? That is a, another example of a fair bet. This one just has a higher variance because you're less likely to get the good outcome in this case, right? So let's talk about what house edge is then, because you've heard probably heard the term, the house always wins. Well, it's true, baby. It's, you know, it's programmed right into the game. So the house edge is basically how much a bet deviates from being a fair bet. Or in other words, how much the house expects to make per bet that you take. So for example, if there's a house edge, well actually, I'll get to that in a sec, all right? It's usually represented as a percentage of the bet made, all right? So if you bet $5 and there's a 50% house edge, then you would ex the house would expect to make $2.50 per $5 bet that you make, all right? Now, it's found by calculating the expected value of a given bet, subtracting that expected value from zero, and then dividing the result by the bet made. So let's look at an example. There is a game that a casino is offering. This game isn't real, but it's a made-up game. But they're just going to flip a coin, and if it's heads, you win 50% of the money that you bet. So if you bet $10, you would win $5 on top of your getting your bet back, right? So now you'd have $15. If you lose, if, you, if it's tails, you lose your entire bet, all right? So if you bet $10, you'd lose all of your money. Let's say that you bet $100. That means that 50% of the time, you're going to win $50. 50% of the time, you're going to lose $100. So the expected value of this bet is negative $50, right? Each time somebody takes this bet, the casino is expecting to make $50 and you're expecting to lose $50. So you subtract that expected value from zero. So zero minus negative 50 is $50. And then you divide that new value by, um, by the bet made. So we have $50 divided by $100, which equals 50%. So the house edge, is 50% for this game, which is really fucking bad, as it turns out. Don't play a game that's like this, all right? <laughs> Just stay away, okay? So, let's get into it then. Given, you know, this talk about House Edge, what is the point of gambling? Well, that's kind of a good question, because honestly, I don't really understand it, but uh, let's, let's get into it, all right? So essentially, what are you doing when you're making a fair bet? All that you're doing is you're keeping the same expected value on your money, which is basically a change of zero dollars. However, you're just increasing the variance on your money, right? If you, This is in the case of a fair bet. So you're basically taking a fixed amount of money and you're making it fall into one of umpteen, you know, million different outcomes, right? You could gain big, you could lose big. You're just increasing the variance on that total, right? Now, when you're gambling at a casino, most bets are not gonna be fair bets. At a casino, all bets are non-fair bets, essentially, okay? So what you're doing is you're essentially paying the price of the house edge in order to have the opportunity to increase the variance on your money, right? So it's not a fair bet, so you're paying money to increase the variance on your money. That's really all you're doing. Why? Well, it's because people like the thrill of it, I guess. They want to win big. They don't want to lose big, but they want the opportunity to win big, right? That volatility is what draws people in, and I guess they're willing to pay a premium for that, okay? So, given that, what makes a gambling method better or worse than others? So, first things first, a lower house edge is going to make a game better, right? If the casino is, on average, making less money from you, that's a better game, right? It's more close to a fair bet, right? Um, another thing we could look at is kind of skill involved in a larger decision space, right? So these are games, right? So the more options you have for what you're doing, the more skill you can use, that's just gonna be a better game, right? You look at a game like Candyland compared to chess, I would tell you that most people would say that chess is the better game because there's more, you know, it's more interesting. There's more stuff to do, right? 
So maybe this will be involved in what makes a casino game better or worse than other ones, all right? Is it fun? These are games. They're supposed to be fun, theoretically, right? So if the game's more fun, maybe I'll rank it a little bit higher, okay? And maybe tied to meaningful events, something like sports betting, where it's tied to an actual physical game. Maybe I'll bump it up a few points. I don't fucking know, but I'm going to give it a try. Why not? Tier lists are fun. Let's just see what happens. All right. Let's just get started with the tier list. I've been yapping enough, all right? First of all, we're going to start with casino games. Now, towards the end, I'm going to cover some other forms of gambling, but we're just going to start with the casino games. They're the most fun. They're uh, the ones that you know and love. Let's get started. So the first one we're going to cover is Baccarat, all right? The most common like form of Baccarat is Punto Banco, all right? So what you're going to do if you're playing Baccarat is you're going to come to the table and you can either bet on Punto or Banco. Whichever one you want. There's also the option to bet on tie, but it's a bad bet. Don't take it. I'm not even going to give it the respect of putting it on the slide, all right? Just choose one of these two. Anyway, what's going to happen after people have placed their bets is the dealer is going to take care of the rest. Everybody playing at the table actually doesn't have any decision making beyond the bet that they've initially made. So what the dealer is going to do is they're going to deal two cards to the player and they're going to deal two cards to the bank, okay? Now, the goal quote unquote, because you're not really doing anything, but essentially the player or the bank is going to win if their hand has a total score closest to nine, all right? And the way you determine that is by scoring the hand. Um, ace through 10 is just worth the point value on the card and all face cards are worth 10 points. So what you're gonna do is just gonna add up the total. So here we have two points plus eight points, which equals 10 points. However, in Baccarat, you always get rid of the tens place on the total, all right? And you just take the ones place, and then that's the score. So in this case, two points plus eight points is 10 points. We discard the tens place, so it is actually worth zero points. Womp, womp, womp. That sucks, all right? Let's go to the bank now. Bank has a king, which is worth 10 points, because it's a face card, plus four points from the other card for a total of 14 points. We discard the tens place, and then the bank has four points, right? So you may think, okay, great, bank wins. That's what we bet on. We get our money now, right? Well, the game isn't necessarily over yet. What the dealer is going to do is they're first going to go to the player and look at their total number of points. If the total number of points for the player is five or less, they're going to deal the player one extra card, just like this. So in this case, it's a seven of clubs, which is worth seven points. So they're going to add that to their existing total, and now our new total is... 17 points, but we still discard the one, so it's just seven points. Well, great, we're beating the bank now, all right? I guess the uh, player's gonna win, which is sad for us because we bet on Bonko, but wait, the dealer is now going to take the bank's turn, all right? Now, the bank has a little bit more complicated logic for if they get a third card or not. I'm not gonna, you know, cover it exhaustively. There's a lot of different rules for it, but essentially what they're gonna do is they're going to look at their total how many points they have for their hand currently, and any cards that the player has drawn, all right? Now, in this case, the bank is gonna get hit with another card here, and they actually draw a five here, which means that they get five extra points added to their hand, so now they're at nine points, which is closer to nine than seven is, because it is nine. And so in that case, the bank wins. So matching the bet there, boom. If you bet on bank, you win. Now. Each side, Punto or Banco, pays out one to one, but if you bet on bank, they take a 5% commission of your winnings because the bank is more likely to win. However, even with this commission, betting on bank has a higher expected value. So you wanna be bet betting on bank regardless of the fact that there's a 5% commission on winnings, all right? So let's cover Baccarat, all right? The decision space is just who to bet on and how much. You just show up, the dealer does the rest, you have basically no say in what happens in the outcome of the game, all right? You just bet on who you want to win, or who you think's going to win. Um, the house edge in this case is 1.06% if you bet on Bonko, which is not too bad, you know, 1.06%. As we'll see later, there are much worse house edges, so it's not the worst. However, the minimum bet here is pretty high usually. You usually go to a Baccarat table, and I think they have a... Um, 
you know, $100 minimum bet a lot of the times. I guess in this picture, there's a $10, $10 minimum bet, but this might be online. But in person, I think they usually have like a, a $100 minimum bet. Generally higher limits, which kind of sucks. And there's basically no advantage play. So advantage play meaning a way to get a, you know, an edge on, um, on the casino, right? Apparently you can technically count cards, but it, it's really hard to do and it doesn't give you much advantage right so there's basically no advantage play you just bet on Bonko and you see what happens pretty boring so let's take a look at our gambling bot army let's see how they did with uh, Bakura so average profit for Bakura was negative $21.26 so most of them lost money on this 55.7% uh, lost an average of $160.20 oof 44.3% won an average of $153.25, with the max winnings going to Lorinda, who won us $1,109 off of the initial $1,000 we gave them, which is great. Thank you, Lorinda. You're the, you're the Bakara champ, all right? Let's take a look at the graph of our outcomes here. So we can see here we have a large spike on the negative $1 to $250 range. Um, so that's where most of these bots landed with, uh, you know, slightly fewer of them actually making a little bit of money. And you can see, you know, kind of peters out as we go further and further away from zero here. So we have some that lost big, you know, some that won big, but, you know, most of them are kind of in the middle here. So uh, to kind of summarize what happens is if you start with $1,000 and you made $20 flat bets, it's basically equivalent to spinning this spinner here, all right, where you have green which gives you 153 bucks and red which gives you negative which takes away 160 bucks so basically if you spun this um once that would be the equivalent of gambling a thousand dollars on bakura all day all right so uh you know it's up to you if you'd want to take that bet but let's take a look at uh what uh, what we lost here all right so we have 700 million dollars still in the bank we're still balling out like champs we gave them a hundred million dollars to gamble with in Bakura. The bots lost two million one hundred twenty-six thousand two hundred eighty-eight dollars of that, and now our new total is we have six hundred ninety-seven million eight hundred seventy-three thousand seven hundred twelve dollars left. So we lost a big chunk of change. Could have bought a you know a, a mid-sized house in a, you know a suburban neighborhood. With, uh, with that, you know, in, at this day and age in uh, California. But, um, you know, let's see, uh, let's see what that looks like. Let's see what dent that makes in our big pile of cash here. Oof, we yeeted off $2 million just like that. Very sad to see, very sad to see. But uh, let's place uh, Bakra on our tier list here. So we lost money, you know, didn't lose like the most amount of money that we could. Um, there's not really any decision making you're doing except just betting on Bonko the entire time and losing money most of the time. Um, you know, on top of that, minimum bets are generally high. So this is kind of a C tier game. You know, could be better, could be worse. Just kind of eh. You know, you just see what happens and it's, it's kind of boring. And the house edge is like, eh, it's all right. So C tier seems pretty, uh, you know, apt for Bakura. So let's move on to our next game. Next game is Blackjack, a very popular gambling game. Uh, you probably have heard of it. And uh, so the way this works is unlike Bakra, you just bet on yourself, right? You can't bet on the dealer winning, you just bet on yourself. And what's gonna happen is the dealer is gonna deal you two cards. And then they're gonna deal themselves two cards, one of which is gonna be face down. They're gonna have the other one face up. Now. Your goal when you're playing blackjack is to get as close to a total of 21 in your hand as possible without going over. If you go over, you bust and you automatically lose. All right, so we don't want that. Now, similar to Baccarat, there's a scoring system based on the rank of the cards in your hand. So two through 10 are just worth the values on the cards. All right, um, face cards are all worth 10 points a piece. And then ace can either be worth one point or 11 points, your choice, right? So what you're going to do is you're going to either hit or stand to try to get as close to 21 as possible. And then the dealer will go. All right. 
So in this case, we've got a total of 14 or a total of four, either one based on what we want the ace to be. So in this case, we're gonna hit here, all right? So we hit and we get a king. A king is worth 10 points. So that means that the total of our hand, if the ace is worth 11, is now 24, which is greater than 21, so we would bust. So we don't want the ace to be worth 11, we want it to be worth one, which in this case means that our total in our hand is 14 uh, points, all right? The dealer has a four, and so we're just gonna stand now, and we're gonna see what the dealer does. So the dealer's gonna flip their face down card, and their total is now 10. Now the dealer, the way that they hit, is deterministic, it's based on a set of rules. If the total of their hand is less than 17, they're just gonna keep hitting until their total is greater than 17, all right? So they're gonna hit here and go up to a total of 16 points in their hand, because they drew a six, and now it's still less than 17, so they're forced to hit again. They get a seven, which means that they bust, because they go up to a total of 23, which is greater than 21. So in this case, the player would win, all right? Because the dealer has bust. Now to note, if the player busts, they play before the dealer, right? So even if the dealer busted in this case, the player is still the one that loses money because they go first. That's part of where the house edge comes in. The player's at a disadvantage compared to the dealer, right? And so that's basically how the game works. There's some other rules that I'll cover here too really quickly. There's splitting where if you get two of the same card, you can essentially split your hand in two and play each hand individually, doubling your bet essentially. There's doubling down where you double your bet, but you only get to hit one more time. So basically you double down, you get one more card, and then you don't get to get any more cards for the rest of the round. You just see if you win or you don't. So this is when you have a good hand and you wanna double your bet essentially, right? There's a natural blackjack, which is when you get dealt an ace and a 10 value card on your opening hand, right? If you get a natural blackjack, you automatically win and you get paid out three to two or six to five in some dick casinos, which you don't want to be playing at, all right? If they pay six to five, don't fucking play there, okay? Three to two is what you want. So you'll get automatically win unless the dealer also gets a natural blackjack, in which case it's a tie and you just get your money back, all right? So natural blackjack, very good. Surrendering is an optional rule that uh, isn't available in, in a lot of places where you can essentially get your first two cards and decide to forfeit half of your bet to essentially tap out, right? So if you get a really bad hand, maybe you want to just tap out and, you know, um, mitigate some losses, but it's not available at most places. And then the last one I'll talk about is insurance where you're essentially making a new bet that the dealer has a natural blackjack. It's a really bad bet, don't ever do it. Just completely ignore it, right? In fact, the best way to play blackjack, barring counting cards, which we're not really gonna get too into here, is just follow this basic strategy chart. So you're gonna wanna, if you're gonna play blackjack, you're gonna wanna memorize this chart, or you can sometimes just print it out and bring it with you to the casino and just look at it to determine what to do. So essentially at the top here, we've got the dealer's face-up card, and then along the side here is the player's hand. So what you're gonna do is, let's say that you have a total of 15, and the dealer's face-up card is an eight. So I'm gonna go up to 15 here, and then I'm gonna go over to eight, and it tells me here to hit. So in that case, I'm gonna hit, excuse me, and then based on what I get after the hit, well, I'll probably stand in this case, and then uh, you're just gonna see what happens. If you have aces, there's a little bit different logic here because um, the ace makes your hand quote unquote soft, not my term. And uh, it tells you essentially what to do based on you know if you have an ace and a, a nine or an ace and a 10. So just look at this chart here. It'll tell you what to do based on the dealer's face up card. Um, but yeah, let's cover uh, blackjack. Let's do a little overview here. So what are the player decisions? Basically how much to bet on yourself and you can stand, you can hit, you can split, you can double down, you can surrender, you can bet on insurance if you're a dumbass. So there's lots, the decision space is relatively large, right? So that's pretty good. That's good because there's more options, it makes the game more interesting, it makes it better. The house edge is about half a percent to two percent depending on rules options, right? So it's generally going to be around 0.6% based on the rules, but you're going to want to pay attention to those rules. The biggest being that you don't want to play at a table that plays natural blackjacks, natural BJs, baby, <laughs> six to five, all right? Only play at tables that pay out three to two, 
because that drastically affects the house edge, all right? And you don't want that in a negative way, all right? So, you know, generally the house edge is gonna be pretty pretty good, right? If it's around 0.6, that's uh, almost half of what you get for Baccarat. And then um, the minimum bets are usually like 10 to 20 bucks, could be more, right? Depending on the table, they're gonna advertise it on the table. And uh, advantage play, there actually is a form of advantage play for blackjack that some people think is illegal, that's a misnomer. It is totally legal to do, and that is card counting, all right? Now, casinos have the right to kick you out if they catch you card counting, right? But it's not illegal. You can totally do it, right? Just try to be a little subtle about it so they don't see you. Essentially, what you're doing is you're keeping track of how many tens are in the deck because the 10 is most detrimental to the dealer, all right? It's most advantageous for you to have more tens in the deck than it is the dealer. So essentially what you're going to be doing is you're going to be keeping a total of when those tens get removed because they're going to be playing through multiple decks shuffled together and as they're removing more and more tens you know that your advantage is decreasing and if there's more and more tens still in the deck your advantage is higher right so you're going to want to bet bigger okay if you do this you can actually get an edge on the house in some cases so that's definitely you know an upside for blackjack right there are some people who have actually made quite a bit of money by exploiting this um, usually it's kind of a group thing like there was an MIT group that was able to make a good amount of money on blackjack which is pretty sick so let's look at how our gambling bot army did they did not um, they don't know how to count cards all right they're just following basic strategy FYI but let's see how they did just following basic strategy so their average profit was they lost twelve dollars and twenty one cents so we still lost money but it's about half of what we lost for Bakra on average uh, 53.5 percent lost an average of hundred seventy nine dollars and fifty seven cents 46.6% on an average of $179.97. So roughly equal there. And then the max profit was $1,100 and uh, 50, 11, sorry, I can't, I can't say numbers. What the hell? $1,150 thanks to Carmina here, the lovely Carmina, blackjack goddess, incredible stuff. And uh, here's our chart. Looks pretty similar to Bakura. We have a few more, you know, really bad outcomes, a few more, you know, really good outcomes, but it's generally around, you know, centered around this losing one to $250 and winning zero to $250. So not the worst. This is what our little spinner would look like. You can see it's close to 50-50 if you're gonna win or if you're gonna lose, right? So it's not the worst, all right? So given all that, let's see how much we lost. We have $697,873,712 se $873, still left in the bank. We gave them $100 million to gamble with on Blackjack. And the bots lost $1,220,770 playing Blackjack. Woof. So our new total is $696,652,942 remaining. So we yeet off another million dollars whatever man it's chump change who gives a shit um so let's move on let's put blackjack on our tier list here so we got uh we lost less money than when we uh, played bakura right which is good uh, additionally there's kind of the advantage play through card counting that's available there's more decisions that make the game a more interesting game for the player even though you're kind of just going off of basic strategy most of the time but it's more interesting than just sitting there and watching what happens so I think that Blackjack goes into B tier for Blackjack, you know, certified B tier game. You know, not the worst when it comes to gambling games. Pretty good, actually. All right, let's move on to craps. Now, if you don't know how to play craps, you're going to see this table and you're going to think, what the fuck is any of this shit? Holy shit. It's like the don't come bar, don't pass, come. It's telling you to come. It's telling you to not come. You know, what are you supposed to do? I love coming, but uh, let's let's just you know talk about the only bets that we care about here. All right, we only care about pass, don't pass, and odds. All right. Um, additionally, there's come and don't come, the try not to come challenge, but um, we're not really going to talk about that because it's essentially the same as pass or don't pass. It's just in the middle of a roll. Essentially, I'm not going to focus on this. It's extremely easy for me to pass the don't the try not to come challenge. All right, we're just not going to do it. So we're going to be talking about pass, don't pass, and odds. So this is half of the board here. This is where you're going to be playing. What you can do is you can bet pass or you can bet don't pass. All right. 
Now, the way that you win your bet is different depending on what you bet on, all right? They're basically opposites. So now, a shooter is gonna be chosen at the table and given two six-sided dice, which they're just gonna roll. In this case, they get a seven, and this is called the come-out roll, all right? The first roll the shooter takes is the come-out roll, and uh, if they roll a seven or an 11, then the pass line gets paid out, and anybody you bet don't pass, they lose their money, okay? Let's go back, though. What if they rolled a three instead? If the player rolls, or the shooter rolls, a 2, 3, or a 12, then anybody who bet the pass line is going to lose now, and anybody who bet the don't pass is going to win. With one exception, if they roll a 12, then it's not, the don't pass line doesn't win. So the pass line still loses, but the don't pass line is just a tie, you just get your bet back. You don't gain anything if they roll a 12. So if you bet don't pass, you win on a 1 or a 2, all right? Now, let's assume that anything else is rolled. So in this case, an 8. So any of these numbers up here, anything that isn't a, a 2, a 3, a 7, 11, or a 12. In this case, an 8. Now what's going to happen is this puck over here, which is set to off, is going to be flipped over by the dealer and then moved over to the 8 spot. Whatever total that they roll from up here, that's where the puck is going to get placed. Now, this is basically the point now, okay? Now the shooter is going to keep rolling until one of two things happens. Either they hit a 7 or they hit the point number. All right. If they hit a 7 before they hit the 8, then anybody who bets don't pass is going to win. Um, if they hit a, an 8 before they hit a 7, then anybody who bets pass line is going to win. Now for those who don't know, whenever you roll two six-sided dice, the most common sum that you're going to get is 7. That means that anybody who's bet don't pass is going to have an advantage here because the shooter is more likely to hit the 7 before they hit the 8. Uh, all players at this point, after the point has been set, are going to have the opportunity to make a separate bet called an odds bet. So they can add odds to their initial bets where you basically put up more money that you're going to hit that number, right? Either the 7 if you bet don't pass or the 8 if you bet pass, whatever the point number is, right? Now what's interesting about these odds bets is that they're actually completely fair bets, but they're only available after the point is set. So they will pay out proportional to the likelihood that the outcome happens. They have no house edge. So the shooter is gonna continue shooting. They're gonna pick up the dice, throw them again. In this case, they get a five, which is not a seven nor the point number, which means they're just gonna keep rolling. They pick them up again, they shoot again, and now they get a seven, which means that they crap out and that means that anybody who bet on pass is going to lose their money. Anybody who bet don't pass is going to get paid out. So pass loses, and then don't pass, they get paid out. Their initial don't pass bet plus their odds bet is going to get paid out. Now let's go back and assume that they threw an 8. In this case, pass line is going to get paid out, and don't pass is going to lose their money. So in this case, don't pass. You can see they got a little bit more money than the don't pass when they won. That's because, as I said, don't pass is less likely to happen. So their odds bets are going to pay out more. It's always proportional to the likelihood that an outcome is going to be happening because it's a fair bet, right? Um, so let's, let's, uh, let's recap. Okay, craps, decisions, basically just what to bet on and how much. And then you kind of just throw dice, but it's completely random, right? So all you can really do is choose what to bet on and how much you want to bet. The house edge is 1.36 per don't pass bet. What's interesting is that actually the don't pass bet has a slightly lower house edge than the pass bet, but people tend to, to uh, play pass because it's considered kind of taboo to, to bet don't pass because people are superstitious about this game. I'll get to that in a bit. But um, odds bets that you place have no house edge, as I said, but they're only available after the point is established. So overall, it's not too bad. 1.36% right? is pretty bad, but given that you get to make a fair bet if a point is established, that means that the, the kind of effective house edge is actually lower depending on how high your odds bets are, right? So it's not actually that bad. It can actually be better than like something like Baccaro with a 1.06% uh, house edge. Now minimum bets are usually gonna be like five to 25 bucks at a craps table. So uh, not too high and advantage play, there's some people out there that believe that dice control is possible, but this is unproven, where they essentially try to like set the dice and toss them 
you know, reliably to get get certain totals that they want and avoid sevens, which is uh, pretty much complete nonsense. It's not really possible to do. So, uh, so for those who don't know, when you roll in um, in craps, you have to throw them and hit the wall of the table. But that wall has a bunch of these foam gators that will kind of hit the dice and cause them to move unpredictably. So dice control is virtually, excuse me, impossible. So uh, those people are full of nonsense, all right? Now, there's a lot of superstition around craps. Uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of them, they're pretty stupid, okay? So one of them is to not enter when the point is established. Apparently that causes bad luck if somebody joins in the middle of a, of a shooter. Uh, shooting and then one of them is to not say seven around the table right because most people are gonna be betting on pass which means that they don't want a seven to be rolled when a point is established right so if you're saying seven you're you're conjuring it into existence you know totally totally valid also as I said earlier people generally only bet pass even though it has a low or a higher house edge than if you bet don't pass uh, just because they want to be rooting for the table what they don't realize is you're not playing against each other, you're playing against the dealer, right? You're playing against the house. So it doesn't matter if somebody bets don't pass, right? Uh, they also say that some shooters are going to be better than others when I established already that dice control is virtually impossible, as far as we know. And then also, when dice are thrown, if they end up showing a 7 on top, the dealer will actually use their cane to knock over the the you know move the dice around so the total doesn't show up as seven anymore because people get superstitious about that or something like that that's a lot of nonsense but anyway let's look at how our gambling bot army did on average they uh they lost eighteen dollars and sixty nine cents uh per you know one thousand dollars now to note the way that they bet in this it's a little bit different than other games they make their initial twenty dollar bet pass or don't pass and they're going to place odds as close to $20 as possible, but they're going to round it to the nearest multiple of the payout for odds, all right? So, for example, the um, if, you, if you put odds on don't pass for an 8 or a 6, you get paid out 5 to 6, all right? So that means that your um, odds bet should be a multiple of 6, basically divisible by 6, or else the casino will round down. So that's essentially the betting strategy. Is bet $20 and then bet an amount on the odds that is um, as close to $20 as possible while still being a multiple of the payout. All right? Then, uh, anyway. So 55.5% of them lost an average of $159.53. 44.5% won an average of $157.18. And the maximum profit goes to Cecilia, spelled weird, uh, which was $978. Congratulations, Cecilia. You made me a lot of money there. Now, here's the uh, wins and losses, a pretty similar chart to what we saw for Baccarat. Um, you know, we got a lot of people losing between one and 250 bucks, etc. Let's see that spinner. Spinner, you know, close to 50-50 as usual. And uh, let's see how much money we lost. So we have $696,652,942 still left in the bank baby gave them a hundred million dollars to gamble with and they lost 1.8 million dollars of it actually i'll say the number well i i've set a precedent of saying every number in completion so one million eight hundred sixty nine thousand two hundred ten dollars is what they lost and the new total is now at six hundred ninety four million seven hundred eighty three thousand seven hundred thirty two dollars left so we eat out about another two million bucks lost on craps very sad very sad I thought casinos were supposed to make you rich, baby. I'm just losing money like crazy. This is ridiculous. What the hell's going on? So, where are we going to place craps on our tier list? So, the house edge, not too bad. I mean, for don't pass and pass, it's 1.36% or whatever the hell it is. Um, which is kind of, you know, it's, it's worse than Baccarat, but the odds bets kind of bring that house edge, the effective house edge down. So, I'd say that the house edge is a little bit better than Baccarat. But uh, still, you're not really making any decisions. You're just kind of saying, I'm betting pass or don't pass, and how much you want to bet. There's the added fun of rolling dice. I do love to roll some dice. Um, but there's also all those bullshit superstitions with it, you know, and people getting mad at you 
for playing optimally. So for that, for all those reasons, I'm going to put craps in C tier. Not a lot of decision making. House Edge, still not as good as Blackjack usually. So uh, C tier for craps, all right? Now we move on to poker. I just want to briefly mention poker, okay? I'm not actually going to have the bots play poker because, as we're going to find out, it's actually a fair bet. There's approximately 500 trillion variants, variants of poker, the most common among them being Texas Hold'em, okay? Um, generally, what you're going to be trying to do is make the best five-card hand possible, which is going to be skill and luck-based. Now, if you play with friends, this is just a fair bet where everybody has an equal opportunity to win, plus or minus your skill level at playing poker. So you can actually have an advantage if you're good at poker compared to your friends, right? So it's just a totally fair bet, all right? But if you're playing at a casino, though, they charge a certain rake or a commission to play at their tables, all right? So it's a flat fee to play or some percentage of winnings taken, whichever one. So generally, you're going to want to just play with friends. There's no commission. There's no overhead. It's a fair bet. You can even kind of eke out an advantage over your friends. I mean, of course, there may be hurt feelings if you swindle them out of all of their money. But, um, you know, it's fun. Just hang out with the boys. Have it be low stakes. You know, $20 buy-in or something. Crack a cold one. Hang out. Just talk and play some poker, right? So if that's the case, I'm definitely going to be placing poker in A tier. It's a fair bet. You know, you're hanging out with friends, yada, yada, yada. If it's at a casino, I'd probably bump it down to B tier. I don't know how bad the commissions are, but at least they're kind of advertised, right? You know what you're getting into. It's not hidden from you, whereas in something like, you know, blackjack or craps, kind of your disadvantage is baked into the game and is less obvious to somebody who isn't informed. So at least they're just going to tell you, Hey, you pay this amount to play poker at this table, and then beyond that, you're not playing against the house, you're playing against other players, right? So poker is definitely an A-tier gambling method. Um, you know, I still wouldn't recommend it, because it's still gambling, but uh, at least it's better than the alternatives, alright? So as I said, bots, I didn't program them to play poker, maybe I'll do that for a future video, I don't know, we'll see. Anyway, let's go to Roulette, another popular casino game. It's very flashy, it's very fun, I will admit. So with roulette, you're gonna have this board over here with a bunch of numbers on it and a bunch of different little boxes. Each of these little boxes are opportunities to bet. So in this case, we're gonna bet on evens, which means that we're going to bet that the ball will fall into an even number, all right? Now, to note, evens does not include zero or zero, zero even though zero is an even number. If you get a zero when you bet on evens, you still lose. There's two opportunities to lose. Basically, there's half of the board is going to be evens minus the additional two, um, you know, zero spots, right? So you have less than 50% chance to win, even though you're betting evens, all right? So then after everybody's made their bets, they're going to spin the wheel and they're going to put the little ball you're going to send it spinning and it's going to fall right into one of these slots. You can tell I, I uh, didn't want to figure out how to do that in animation. I don't give a fuck about how physics work. It fell into the 14. I don't care. Anyway, we bet on evens, which means that we win in this case because 14 is an even number. So we get paid out one to one for an evens bet. Um, now, let's talk about roulette as a whole. Decisions are basically what to bet on and how much. You have no control over the ball. The dealer is the one that's going to be, you know, setting the ball in motion. It's completely out of your control. All you do is bet on what you think the number is going to be, basically. Um, the house edge for every single bet that you make on the board, if there are two zeros on the roulette table, is 5.26%. So every possible bet has this house edge. It's just that if you bet on a specific number, it has a higher variance. It's less likely to happen. So the payout is higher, but it still has the same expected value with a house edge of 5.26%. That's PB&J, pretty bad and all that jazz, all right? Compared to our other ones, which are like 1.06%, 0.6%, 5.26% is pretty fucking bad. The minimum bet for roulette is generally 5 to 25 bucks, and uh, advantage play is that there's basically none. Apparently there was some dude 
who got a roulette table and he was able to like figure out based on the starting conditions approximately where the ball would end up yada 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 some horse shit like that i don't i don't know if that's true or not but for the average person you just watch the ball go around which i admit is pretty fun it's pretty fun watching that ball go around and yeet itself into one of those spots but um you have basically no control over the uh the outcome you just watch and see what happens so let's see how our gambling bot army did the average profit was negative $99.80. Oof, that is pretty fucking bad. 70.2% lost an average of $193.54. Jesus, 70% of them did. 29.8% won an average of $121.15. Now, I should mention their strategy for this was just to bet lows every time. All right, so it's similar to betting evens. It's basically betting on half of the board over and over and over again, right? Um, the maximum profit was $980, which Elvina, which I don't even think is a real fucking name. It sounds like some, you know, young adult fantasy novel protagonist. <laughs> anyway, I don't know. I just got the list of names online. It was a random name list or whatever. So I don't know. It's kind of a weird name. Anyway, here's our uh, chart here. Now you can see, unlike the Baccarat chart, which had kind of the majority of them losing, you know, one to 250 bucks and then slightly fewer winning zero to 250 bucks, we can see here that significantly fewer people are winning anything, right? As you can see here, 70% lost money, 30% won money, which is pretty bad, pretty darn bad. Let's take a look at our spinner here. You can see here the green part is uh, significantly smaller than it was in past games. So uh, roulette, not looking so great, not looking so hot. Let's see how much, uh, let's see what the damage is, all right? So we have $694,783,732 still left at the bank. We gave them $100 million to gamble with on roulette. They lost $9,980,340 of that $100 million we gave them. Sheesh. And our new total is now $684,803,392. Jesus, man, that's brutal. So uh, let's see how much money we lose. We yeet off about $10 million. That is, um, it's not great. Not great. I feel pretty bad about that. But our, our pile of cash is still huge. I'm sure that future games are going to pay us out handsomely. I could just feel it. I know that you go into casino and you make money. You just, that's just how it works, man. So let's place uh, roulette up on the uh, tier list here. That's definitely a D tier, right? It uh, We lost way more money on roulette than any of the other games. There's basically no decision making. There's no advantage play. The only benefit, the only thing that keeps out F tier is the fact that the fun little ball rolls around and makes a satisfying noise, you know? That part's pretty cool. I do enjoy that part, but overall, D tier game, wouldn't recommend it. Now, let's talk about slot machines, all right? Talking about flashy nonsense here. We got some slot machines here. You got the Eye of fucking Sauron, 007. We got more slot machines, Stinking Rich, Magic Wishes, Wolf Run Gold. We got these machines over here, Pirates, blah, 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 blah. They're everywhere. They're fucking everywhere. And let me tell you, it's all certified nonsense. Spoiler alert. These things are fucking ripoffs, okay? Let's get into it. So what slot machine are we going to be talking about today? We're going to be talking about this red, white, and blue slot machine, okay? Red, white, and blue is an old slot machine that's pretty simple, okay? It's got three reels. you got the, you know, the one here, the one here, and the one here. And they have uh, a variety of symbols on them, okay? If you match up three symbols or, you know, there's kind of a payout chart that will tell you how much you make when you line up a certain set of symbols. Um, casinos don't have to disclose the actual expected payout. So the, here's the payout up here, but they don't have to tell you the odds of any of these outcomes happening. So you just go up and you just kind of guess. You get a feel for how likely things are, but you're not going to know. And here's a hint. Here's a hint for you. It's a total ripoff. All right. There are these things called par sheets, which don't have to be disclosed. They're actually proprietary that are basically design documents for these slot machines that will tell you how likely different outcomes are. But it's all proprietary. As I said, you go up to a slot machine, you have no idea what the odds are. The odds for this machine, though, was reverse engineered 
There's a website called wizardofodds.com, which is great. I'll link it in the description if you're interested in learning more about these different gambling games, the numbers behind them. Definitely very interesting, cool to check out. Um, and that's where I got these numbers, all right? So this is the payout table for red, white, and blue. Um, and as you can see here, if you get a red seven, a white seven, and a blue seven, if you put one coin in, you win 2,400 coins. If you put, you know, one coin in and you get a red seven, a red seven, and a red seven, you get 1,100, so you get 1,199 coins back. So you start looking at these numbers and you kind of realize this doesn't look so bad, actually. If you crunch the numbers, it's not that bad. It looks pretty good, actually, if we make certain assumptions. So we make an assumption that blanks, and blanks are basically when it lands between, you can see over here, between two symbols. That's a blank. So let's say that blanks happen about 50% of the time for any given reel. And let's say that each other symbol is equally likely, right? Well, in that case, we have a 4.75% chance to win to get any of these outcomes here, right? And, uh, you know, any of these outcomes besides blank, 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 you just get your money back. Okay, so I'm not counting those as a win. And you get 2.71 coins. That's our expected value for every one coin bet, if we make these assumptions, which is pretty fucking good. I mean, we put a coin in, we get, on average, about three out, which is an infinite money glitch, right? I mean, why wouldn't anybody play this game? That's ridiculously good. Well, it's actually worse than you think, okay? Because the symbols are rigged to not appear as, you know, they're not equally likely to appear on any given reel. Instead, there's a random number that's generated by the machine, and that will determine what these set of reels are, all right? So let's look at reel one, for example. So you can see here, the jackpot payout is a red seven, a white seven, and a blue seven, in that order. So if we look here though, a red seven only has a one out of 64 chance of appearing on reel one. And a white seven only has a one out of 64 chance of appearing on reel two. And on reel three, a blue seven only has a one out of 64 chance of appearing. So you can see here, it's extremely unlikely that you're gonna get a red seven, a white seven, and a blue seven uh, because it's rigged, essentially. And once again, they don't have to tell you this. So there, certain symbols are more or less likely to appear on certain reels, which makes the pay table, certain outcomes in the pay table, way less likely. And it's not obvious, right? So now we actually have a higher chance of winning in general, a 4.85% chance to win, but our expected value is now negative 0.1342 coins per one coin bet which means that high payouts are actually extremely rare. We're more likely to win, but it's gonna be a low total. And every one coin that we put in, we're expecting to lose 0.13 coins, which is a far cry from that plus 2.71 coins that I was you know, calculating based on a fair game where the reels aren't rigged, right? So that's pretty bad. And all slots are a variant of this. There's some that have more flashy mechanics that are there to basically engage you, but they're all just random number generators that are rigged to look like you have a higher chance of winning than you really do, and they just try to get you addicted. There's near misses programmed in. It's all a bunch of bullshit, okay? So, decisions. All you do is you put money into the machine and that's it. So it's just how much to bet, nothing else. You push a button after you put money into a machine. Um, the house edge can be between 5 and 20%. It depends on the machine, and you don't know what the house edge is going to be because they aren't required to disclose it. So you could have a horrible house edge by going up to one machine and not even realize it, right? They don't have to tell you. Now, red, white, and blue has a house edge of 13.42%, which is more than double that of roulette. Ridiculous. The minimum bet is one cent, usually for slot machines. You've heard of penny slots. Literally, you're putting in a penny, you know? Um, but that's because they can just set these things out everywhere. People will play on them. They don't have to be manned, and pe they just make money. They're just money-making machines for the casino. They're everywhere, too. You get off the air, you know, you get out of the airport at uh, um, Las Vegas. They're, they're just all over the place. It's ridiculous. Advantage play, there's a nut. You just push a button, you see what happens. 
So let's see how our gambling bot army did playing red, white, and blue. So the average profit was negative $189.02, meaning the average bot lost close to $200 playing slots. 74.2% lost an average of $662.31 of the initial $1,000. That's pretty fucking bad. 25.8% won an average of $1,173.37. And the maximum profit from Emma, spelled weird, I need to check this name list, anyway, was $7,360. So let's take a look at our table here. Now this looks very different from our earlier tables. You can see almost nobody made close to $0. There's nothing close to the middle here. You're either losing big or you're winning big and very small, you know, a small percentage of people are winning big, quote unquote. But most of the time you're losing a ton of money. So this is a very high variance game where most people are losing between $500 and $750 of that initial thousand. So let's take a look at the spinner here. Pretty bad, all right? So you got this tiny little green area here, close to a quarter, um, where you're making about 1100 bucks, but most of the time you're gonna be losing $662. So uh, pretty damn bad. Let's see what the damage is. So we have $684,803,392 still in the bank. We gave them, excuse me, $100 million to gamble with. And the bots lost 18,901,500 of it. So their new total is now $665,901,892. Let's see the money get yeeted away. Holy shit, that went really quick. That went faster than I thought. All right, well, we, we have to take from the top now, I guess, because the bottom is... Oh, man, we lost some from the bottom, too. I thought it was over. Holy shit, that's pretty fucking bad. We lost close to $20 million on slots. That is completely ridiculous. I mean, we still got a big chunk of change here. We're not going broke, but that is definitely disappointing to see. Let's place it on the tier list. I mean, this is just an easy F tier, as I said. They're deceptive. They're designed to get you addicted to gambling. Um, it's just a complete ripoff. They don't have to disclose to you the house edge or odds at all. But you can see here, typical machine is going to have like 13 to 15 percent house edge. Total bullshit. Don't play slots. If you're going to gamble, do not play slots. All right, you heard it here. Probably not first, but you heard it here. All right, let's talk about video poker now. Now, video poker is interesting because they're actually played on machines that look relatively similar to slots but they work very differently than slots, all right? Essentially what's gonna happen is you're gonna put some money into the machine and then you're gonna get dealt, excuse me, dealt five cards from a 52 card deck on the screen. So in this case, we have the two of spades, a four of spades, a seven of hearts, an ace of spades, and a 10 of diamonds. Now, after you get this initial hand, your goal is to make the best five card poker hand possible using one set of discards, all right? So what you're gonna do is you're gonna choose any number of cards from this five card hand to keep. So in this case, we're gonna hold on to the ace of spades. All of the rest of them are gonna get discarded. So we're gonna discard the two of spades, it gets replaced with an ace of clubs. The four of spades gets replaced with a four of hearts. The seven of hearts gets replaced with a three of uh, spades. And the 10 of diamonds gets replaced with an ace of hearts. So we held on to the ace of spades. In this case, we have three aces now, which is three of a kind. And so we're actually gonna win on this hand. All right, that's basically how you know video poker works, pretty simple. Choose the cards you wanna hang on to, discard the rest, see if you get a winning hand, all right? Now the most common variant of video poker is gonna be jacks or better, all right? So jacks or better is just what it says, all right? You have to get a pair of jacks or better in order to win. Now this is the full pay table, all right? Full pay meaning that essentially what casinos can do is they can set the pay table to pay less for like a full house or a flush or a straight, which lowers your expected value. If you're gonna be playing video poker, what you're gonna to wanna to do is you're gonna to check to see if they have the full pay table, all right? If they don't have it, you probably don't wanna play because your odds are worse, okay? So in this case, if you got a Royal Flush, you get paid out 800 to one, all right? Royal Flush is incredibly rare. It's where you get um, a straight of 10 Jack, 
queen, king, ace, all in the same suit. Extremely rare, but you'll get paid out 800 to one if you do get it. Um, but like I said, you want a full pay table. Anyway, this assumes that you make five coin bets. That's another thing. If you make a five coin bet, the jackpot, the royal flush, pays out better, which significantly raises the EV. So you want to be able to play using five coin bets, okay? And uh, not every, you know, as I mentioned earlier, not every video poker machine has this pay table. Avoid any video poker machines that do not pay out this pay table, all right? Now, just like blackjack, video poker actually has an optimal strategy. It's just a little more complicated than blackjack. Let's take a look. Well, here's the first set of rules. All right, well, there's 25 rules. Basically, you start at the top and you go down. You check if any of these rules apply to your hand, and it'll tell you what to keep, okay? So, you know, 25 rules, that's not that bad. Wait, actually, oh, there's 36 rules. Okay, so 26 to 36. All right, well, that's, that's not too bad. I mean, it's still 36. Oh, but I forgot to mention the three different types of straight flushes that you can get. So there's type 1 and type 2 and type 3. What is this, diabetes? Um, and then, oh, the, all the, the exceptions with these footnotes here. So there's certain exceptions in certain cases. Now, I got this from the wizardofodds.com, which once again is linked in the description. Uh, he very generously offered up this optimal strategy, but as you can see here, it's not the most straightforward shit. So you can either try to memorize all of this, which would be kind of difficult, or you can actually just print it out and probably bring it with you. In general, most casinos just prohibit you from using electronic devices when gambling, but they'll let you bring like a piece of paper up, a little cheat sheet. So you basically all you're going to do is print it out, start at the top, see if any of these apply to your hand, go all the way down until you find one that does, and then just do what it says. Basically keep whatever it tells you to keep, all right? But a little bit more complexity in the optimal strategy for video, video poker. So let's, uh, let's re you know, recap for video poker here. Decisions is basically how much to bet, how much you're putting in the machine. Like I said, make five coin bets. And then there's 32 possible different ways to keep or discard cards for your hands. So that's quite a few, actually, right? Quite a few things to consider. You know, follow that optimal strategy, as I mentioned. Now, the house edge, if you're using optimal strategy with five coin bets, is around 0.46% which is better than blackjack playing with basic strategy with ideal conditions. However, it has a very high variance. So even though you're getting a better expected value, the variance is very, you know, is really high because a lot of this relies on you being able to get a royal flush, which is incredibly rare, okay? So, you know, house edge though, that's pretty damn low. That's one of the lowest house edges out of any games in the casino. It's just high variance, all right? And the minimum bet is usually going to be like a quarter up because the machine's similar to a, um, you know, a, a slot machine. And so, you know, put a quarter in, play video poker, 0.46% house edge, not the worst. Advantage play is not really anything except the optimal strategy. So you wanna, you're going to want to know uh, how to play optimally. You're going to want to play at a full pay table and you want to make five coin bets. There you go. So let's see how our gambling bot army did. Well, on average, they lost about $22.16. Now, to note, I ran this a few times, and each time I was getting a different number here. It's because, as I said, the game is pretty high variance. So even with 100,000 bots, the um, results were unpredictable. So even though there's a 0.46% house edge, in this case, we just got kind of unlucky, um, lost more than average here, all right? So 61.1% lost an average of $284.60. 38 or 38.9 percent won an average of 389 dollars and 37 cents and our video poker champ was nanette i think that's how you pronounce it which who won um 17,080 dollars so nanette is the video poker champ baby let's take a look at our uh, chart here so you can see here most people are losing between one and 250 bucks um and slightly fewer of them are losing between 250 dollars and 500 dollars but then you start to get, you know, there's more of these high outcomes available compared to other games. As I said, high variance. So you got these big winners winning $17,000 up here. It's just less likely to happen, more volatility. And so for that reason, well, actually, sorry, here's the little spinner here. You can see a, uh, you know, 
about a um, two-thirds chance of losing $284 and a one-third chance of uh, winning $389. So let's see how much we lost from all this video poker playing. We had $665,901,892 still left in the bank. We gave them $100 million to gamble with. They lost $2,216,460 of it playing video poker. So our new total is now $663,685,432 yet left. So we yeet out another $2 million. Not the worst, similar to Baccarat or Craps. And uh, let's place video poker up here, all right? So technically, video poker has a pretty low house edge. It's relatively fun, you know? You can just kind of like, it's kind of like uh, Bellatro if you played that game, but you're just playing one hand at a time, five cards each. Um, so house edge low, good decision space, which makes it interesting. Uh, I'm gonna place uh, video poker in B tier. Not quite as good as poker because poker has, you know, it's a totally fair bet. But uh, video poker, kind of fun. Not a, you know, not a bad house edge. You got that opportunity to get the big jackpot if you get a royal flush, which is incredibly unlikely. But um, yeah, that definitely is going to go in B tier, one of the better casino games. Now, let's move on to non-casino gambling. So we have casino games, obviously, but then there's some games and some ways that you can gamble that don't involve a casino at all. So let's start off with day trading. Now, a lot of you may be wondering, what the hell are you talking about, man? This isn't gambling, this is investing. There's so many people on YouTube who are telling me how I can make X amount of money, become rich day trading, baby. They have day trading bots. They have courses you can buy to day trade. Well, let me tell you, it is a form of gambling, and I'll get to it. You're buying and selling stocks in the same day. What you're trying to do is essentially time the market. You're predicting price movement, right? So they're gonna look at charts like this, they're going to try to buy on a dip and then sell at an apex, basically a local maximum. That's all they're trying to do is predict price movement. But this is just gambling, all right? This is unpredictable, and it's there's no reliable way to do it. I'll get to the data in a sec here. So who's the house here? They're actually the brokerages and institutions, all right? So when you're day trading, you're going to be doing it on some sort of a market, right? Or some sort of platform like a Fidelity or whatever. You're going to be buying and selling. These brokerages might have outright fees or something like that, right? Um, but they may not. They may, may be commission-free. If it's commission-free, what they're doing is they're routing all of your buy and sell orders to an institution, a market maker, that's going to be able to take advantage of the spread on your buy orders, right? So you're still losing money. You're not getting the best price if it's commission-free. You're still losing money on every trade that you make, essentially, from these institutions. So they're the house here. Now, there's basically two different, well, three different forms of, of commonly of day trading, all right? There's buying and selling stocks in the same day. But there's also options trading, where you're not even trading assets. You're trading contracts built on top of assets, what they're called are derivatives, where you're essentially selling the right to buy a security at a certain price. So it gets even more complicated with options trading because they're all these weird derivative products. Um, and then there's Forex, which is foreign exchange trading, where you're basically switching currencies into other types of currencies in the day to try to take advantage of when certain currencies are stronger compared to other currencies um, and try to make money based on that. I'm not going to really be talking about Forex, but it's all forms of gambling, all right? Um, let's go into how successful day traders are. Let's look at some of the data. So what does successful mean exactly? It doesn't mean that you just make money like other forms of gambling would. Instead, it means that you're actually beating the market because the market already has a positive expected value. If you just buy an index fund and you sit on it, chances are you're going to make money in the long run. So it has a positive expected value. So in order for day trading to be worth it, compared to just buying an index fund, it actually has to be better than the market, right? If you're making money, but it's half of what somebody who made from, an, you know, what somebody made from an index fund, what's the point of day trading? You're not a successful day trader, right? So let's take a look at some of the numbers, all right? I got this number. I'll, I'll link it in the description below. 
Um, this, I'll link the, the research um, and the video that I got this from. It's from uh, Ben Felix's channel, uh, where he does common sense investing. He's a Canadian portfolio manager, has really informative videos. Definitely check his stuff out if you're interested. Like I said, I'll link it in the description below. But uh, there was a study done where in Taiwan between 1995 and 1999, less than 1% of day traders were able to beat the market consistently, which is ridiculously low, right? 99% of day traders were trailing the market, right? Which is completely ridiculous. Now you may be saying, okay, that's Taiwan in 1995. Let's look at some day traders in Brazil who started between 2013 and 2015. Now, these are very specific data sets because it's difficult to get all this data. Um, but, uh, but in this case, this is a more recent example. Uh, and this is the futures market. So futures are a form of options. They're basically derivatives, as I was saying before. These people are trading them. And uh, what the study found is that the more trading activity that people were taking... Um, there, there was less profit to be gained. Okay, so basically the more trades you were making, the worse off you were doing. 97% of people who traded for more than 300 days out of the year, the most frequent tra traders, actually lost money. 97% of them. They didn't even just trail the market, they explicitly lost money, which is really bad. So the more trades you're making, the more house edge there is, the more institutions and brokers are winning, and it's just gambling, okay? So, the docs and vids are gonna be linked in the description so you can take a look for yourself. I'd highly recommend you check it out if you're, uh, if you're doubting what I'm saying to you right now. So, uh, let's go over, let's recap on day trading. Decisions, what to buy, when to buy, and when to sell, so that's another thing. It's you buy in and you have to sell at a specific time too, which, is very complicated. There's a lot of, you know, factors here. You can see these charts here. People try to make sense of these charts. It's just a random walk, essentially. It's just a crapshoot. There isn't a reliable way to time these dips and, you know, if you're not an institution, all right? The house edge depends on the brokerage fees or like margin. So for example, a lot of brokerages, they offer something called a margin account where they lend you money to basically to trade with right and those margin loans are going to have an interest rate and there's something called a margin call as well where if you, the total capital in the margin account dips below a certain amount all of your assets get liquidated and sold so liquidated means sold and then used to pay off the loan so it's really risky highly risky and then these brokerages will make money off of the interest paid on those margins and then even, like I said, $0 commission brokers aren't free because they're routing your trades to institutions. They're getting paid to route them to certain institutions that can basically screw you over. You're not getting the best price. So no matter what, institutions and brokerages are profiting off of your trades. Informed institutions, likewise, have way more data than you and they have way more capital than you do. So they have more control over the market. So they're able to take advantage of your bad trades better than you ever will be just because they're more informed. Advantage play could be insider trading, I guess, but that's illegal. So we're not going to talk about that. Don't try it. Um, and I mean, I don't even know if it would help you that much in day trading. It'd be more stock picking. But um, just there's not really a form of advantage play. Don't buy people's courses. Don't, you know, pay to use a trading bot. It's all bullshit. All right. It's all gambling. Complete bullshit, complete nonsense. And so for that reason, I'm putting day trading in C tier, all right? It's risky, it is gambling, it's just just buy an index fund. If you're gonna invest, just put your money into index funds and let it grow over time, all right? That's risky enough, just do that. Don't day trade. There's so much time you can spend on trying to make sense of these graphs. It's not gonna give you any advantage. The less you do, the better, all right? Passive investing is the way to go. C tier for day trading, just gambling. All right, let's talk about the lottery next. All right, you guys probably know about the lottery. You go to a gas station, you get yourself a Powerball ticket, get yourself some Marlboro Reds, and you get yourself a Red Bull. It's a good time. I'm not going to lie, I love just going to a gas station. You know, you're on a road trip, you're pumping some gas, you go in, you get some snacks. It's a great time, all right? So here we got a ticket. We have... 10 or sorry five sets of numbers for ten dollars here okay 
So what you're gonna do is you're gonna give either give the cashier the numbers that you want, or they can randomly generate them for you. So in this case, all of our power balls are 22, the rest are random. So uh, here's what's gonna happen is you're gonna buy the, the lottery ticket and you're gonna wait for the drawing. So in this case, they're gonna draw a 49 and we have a 49 on our first line here. We have a 49 on our last line here. So we're starting off good. We got two numbers already out of our five tickets, our five numbers here. All right, let's draw another one. 26, ooh, 26 does not appear on any of our numbers here. We got 38, and uh, 38 appears right here, right there, there we go. So we got a nice little 38 there. We got a 59, 59, we don't have 59 on our ticket anywhere. And we got 47, uh, we don't have 47 anywhere. All right, well, well at least maybe we can get the Powerball of 22, come on, and it's a two. All right, so uh, we only got one match on these three numbers, and one match with no Powerball pays nothing. So we just paid $10 and we got nothing out of it. Now for those who don't know, the way Powerball works, this is a specific lottery, is that all of these balls have a number between one and 69. And they will be drawn at random uh, from this big, they have this big funny, I don't know, like pneumatic tube thing. <laughs> and it will pop out a number between one and 69. You'll get a set of five numbers um, you can't get duplicates on the first five numbers and they pop out a power ball which can be a number between 1 and 26 it can be a repeat of one of these numbers and then what you do is you just match up the numbers on your lotto ticket and you see if you won anything all right so we take a look here this is the prize chart don't pay attention to these power play numbers I just included them because that's another offering we're not going to go into it look at take a look at the first column here all right so if you get all matching numbers plus the power ball you get the grand prize, all right? The grand prize is a jackpot, which is a variable amount. I think right now when I'm recording this video, it's about $121 million or something like that. Then uh, if you match five, you get $1 million. And then, you know, the fewer matches you get, you uh, get less and less money. Most of these require having a Powerball match, which is a one out of 26 chance. As you can see here, if you get one match in a Powerball or a Powerball, you get $4, all right? But uh, anything less than three matches, you don't get anything if you don't have the Powerball match as well. All right, here are the odds of everything happening. If you total it all up, there's a 4.02% chance to win anything and a 88 cents expected value, which is pretty bad given that tickets cost $2 a pop. So that is a huge house edge, and we'll get to that in a sec here. The decisions on the lottery are how many tickets to buy and the numbers on each ticket. Now, technically what you should do is just go with a random number on the ticket. You don't want to use, excuse me, the same numbers as other people because if it happens to be the jackpot, you're going to have to, geez, I'm burpy right now, sorry. <laughs> you're going to have to split the jackpot with everybody else who won. So you really do want it to be a random number, but it's so unlikely to happen that who even gives a shit, all right? Now, the house edge here is more than 55.77%, which is awful. Do you remember that, that example I gave at the beginning when I was explaining house edge? I was talking about how bad it would be if something had a 50% edge. This is a 55.77% house edge. That means that for every $2 ticket you're buying, they're expecting to make more than half of that back, right? which is completely ridiculous, a terrible bet. Also, this is state-sponsored, by the way. This is government-funded, government-supported, which is totally ridiculous because it's a tax on the poor. The only people who are playing the lottery are people who are basically poor to like middle class, right? Rich people aren't playing the lottery. There are these people, they're preying on people who are desperate, essentially, who, ha who want that chance to win the lottery. And so it's essentially functions as a tax on the poor. I'm not going to get too into the weeds with it, but it's totally ridiculous. I hate it. And uh, advantage play is that there's extremely rare lotteries that actually have an expected value above one in certain situations. So there was a story about this couple that, that was able to game. Um, there's a lottery called like Windfall that had a specific rule that actually allowed them to get an advantage in certain situations that they made millions of dollars off of it 
but then the, the game was discontinued. So there are certain new lotteries that may have some sort of, you know, exploit baked into them, but this is extremely rare. I only know of that one particular case with one particular lottery. Most of the time you're getting a 55% house edge, baby. Anyway, let's look. Uh, actually, yeah, the gambling bot army also played the lotto, so they left the casino and went to their local gas station to buy some lotto tickets, baby. And let's see how they did. On average, they lost $891.38 from the $1,000 I gave them to spend on lotto tickets. Holy shit. 99.93% lost an average of $985.36. Jesus. 0.07% won an average of $126,022.60. And our max profit was Cassie, who got $999,000 and 70, or sorry, $999,077. So they won almost the jackpot, actually. They got that uh, five matches without the power balls. That's pretty impressive. Uh, but let's take a look at our chart here. <laughs> All of them, basically all of them, you're losing more than $750. There's very few. You can't even see the winners on this chart. There's so few of them. Let's take a look at our, our spinner here. All right, would you, would you spin this spinner? If you get it directly, pixel perfect, at the top, you will win a million dollars. Otherwise, you lose about $1,000. Would you take that bet? I wouldn't. Well, let's see what the damage is. All right, so we have $663,685,432 still left in the bank. We gave them $100 million to gamble with, and they lost $89,137,822 of that $100 million we gave them. Oh, my God. The new total is now $574,547,000. 610 dollars left i almost couldn't say the number because i was so flabbergasted with how much money i just lost on the lottery i thought we were supposed to win big man we could have won like the jackpot of 121 million dollars what the hell is going oh my god all my wealth is depleting before my eyes this is completely ridiculous what the hell so we just lost a fuckload of money so obvious f tier for Powerball, in any form of lotteries pretty much, except for those ones that maybe have a positive expected value, it's completely ridiculous. It is state-funded gambling that exploits poor people, and it has a horrible house edge. Never play the lottery. Please, for the love of God, just play poker with your friends. Don't do the lottery. It's ridiculous. It's a horrible deal. All right. Now, let's move on to a form of gambling called not gambling. The way that you play not gambling is you approach a slot machine, just as so, you look it up and down and glare at it, and you walk away, and you don't gamble. It's very fun. It's a good time. It's a, it's a, you know, it's a pretty fun game. So let's take a look at how not gambling performs, all right? Decisions. What flavor Red Bull you want to buy with all the money you didn't gamble, all right? You have all the money that you starred with. Exactly. All right. Let's see. What's the house edge? It's about 0.01% because one bot got mugged by one of the lotto losers. Uh, one of them got frustrated and beat the shit out of one and stole his $1,000. So I'd say on average, when by not gambling, you're, you know, you're losing about 0.01% of your wealth. Uh, advantage play would be re investing for retirement. Uh, this, is a, this is a common form of, of getting a you know, an edge on the house is putting money into a 401k or, you know, buying index funds, etc., etc. Uh, pretty good form of advantage play there. So let's take a look at our gambling bot army results with, uh, you know, not gambling. So here we, oh, this popped up early. I forgot to animate that. It's a joke, though. I don't give a shit. Average profit, oh, negative $0.00001 from that one bot that lost $1,000 for me. 0.001% uh, lost an average of $1,000, and everybody else uh, won an average of $0. Max profit was $0, which was a 99,999-way tie. And uh, here we go. You have a chart here. Uh, almost everybody at $0 here, and we got our spinner, which I already spoiled by forgetting to animate. Um, but there you go. You got the spinner. Um, you just spin it, and uh, there's a tiny chance you'll lose $1,000 if somebody decides to mug you. Let's take a look at how much we lost from not gambling. 
We have 564 or $564,619,245 still in the bank. We gave them $100 million to not gamble with. Uh, we lost 1000 of it from that one bot who got mugged. But then I confiscated that $1,000 back from the mugger and damned him for eternity. So our new total is $564,619,245. So uh, not bad. I'm actually going to put uh, not gambling in S tier because, uh, you know, unlike all these other alternatives of gambling, we actually didn't lose any money, which is uh, insane. So that definitely has to be S tier just to, uh, for that alone. A little bit of a boring game, but, uh, but hey, we didn't lose any money. That's better than everything else here. Now let's talk about sports betting real quick. This is the last form of gambling I'm going to be talking about. Uh, so this is a screenshot from DraftKings, which is a popular sports betting app. And uh, this is for the NFL. You can bet on various sports, but we're just going to talk about football betting because I think that's the most popular betting probably. And so here uh, you can bet on the spread. The spread is essentially the um, point difference between the winning and losing team, right? So in this case, you could bet plus 5.5 points for the spread or minus, you know, less than 5.5 points for the spread, uh, whichever one you want to bet on. There's the total, so it's the difference between the scores, excuse me. There's the total here, which is uh, total points scored in the game. So in this case, you could bet over 45.5 points scored or under 45.5 points. You could bet the money line, which is just who's going to win between these two teams here in this game. And uh, let's talk about what these numbers mean, okay? So the first number here, if it has a plus sign in front of it, that means how much you win if you bet $100, all right? The other one, if it has a minus sign in front of it, that means how much money you have to bet to win $100. So in this case, if you bet on the Falcons, you have to bet $100 to win $195. And with the Eagles, you have to bet $238 to win $100. So... How are these numbers decided? Uh, I forgot to animate this slide too. It's all good though. Um, the opening odds are determined through statistical analysis. Essentially, you have these experts that use various factors, historical data, you know, expert analysis, weather, etc. It's all kind of proprietary information to determine those opening odds. They've got some sort of algorithms that determine the opening odds. And then they're adjusted over time based on changing conditions potentially and then market inflows and outflows for certain bets. So if a certain bet is getting a lot of money pumped into it, the odds might be lowered for it, right? So what's the house edge here? If there's a fair bet, the plus or minus should be equal. So if you took both sides of the bet, you should gain or lose zero dollars. So let's go back to this here. These two numbers should be equal if it's a fair bet, right? So if you bet $100 to win $195, you should be able to bet $195 on the more likely outcome to win $100. However, that is not the case here. So basically to compute the house edge, you compute the implied probability of the bets. I'll explain what that means in a sec. And you sum them to get the over round, all right? You divide that by the one by, sorry, you divide one by the over round and then you subtract one. It'll make sense in a sec here. Let me give an example. So bookies are, let me just tell you, bookies are essentially treating each bet as if it's more likely to happen than it really is for the payouts. So let me explain. So we have the Atlanta Falcons versus the Philadelphia Eagles here. And we're talking about the money line here. So plus 195 for the Falcons, minus 238 for the Eagles. So, the implied odds of the Falcons are about 100 out of 100 plus 195, which is 33.9%. So the payout for if the Falcons win is essentially as if there is a 33.9% chance that the Falcons win. Now, the implied odds of the Eagles is 238 over 238 plus the $100 that you win, which means that the implied odds of the Eagles winning is 70.4%. Now what you may notice though, is that these two percentages when summed together is greater than 100. You can see here that that's the over round. So essentially they're paying out as if there's a 70.4% chance that the Eagles win and a 33.9% chance that the Falcons win, but that is more than 100% probability. So they're paying you less 
than what the actual odds are. So what you do to determine the house edge is you take this over round number, you divide 100% by that over round percentage, and then you subtract 100%, and then you get the, net, the uh, house edge here, which is negative 4.13%, which means per bet, the bookie is expecting to make 4.13% of the bet made. So let's look at, take a look at the house edges for all of these different games here. You can see that most of them are around 4 to 4.5%. The money line bets have a slightly lower house edge than these spread and total bets in general. But uh, what you can do is you can compute the house edge per bet to determine how much money you're expected to lose on the bet that you're making, right? So sports betting, it's basically what to bet on and how much. The house edge is more than 4% in a lot of cases. We're using DraftKings as an example here, which is um, pretty bad, but it depends on the sports book and whichever bet you're making. And uh, one of the good things, though, is that this is actually kind of based on real events. You're not just watching dice be rolled or cards be played. It's actually based on a game, which might get you, you know, an advantage. Or like, might you get more? Get, might get you more invested. Excuse me, I can't speak. More invested in a game, you know. So that adds to the fun factor, right? You're watching game. You got money on the line. And uh, the form of advantage play would just be, I guess, to know more about sports, I guess, if that gives you an advantage, who knows. So we're going to play sports betting in the C tier as well. So it would be D tier because those, you know, house edges are pretty close to what we get for roulette. You know, 4%, significantly worse than craps or baccarat. However, the fun factor of being able to bet on, you know, a team winning, watch the game, get invested, all that kind of stuff, at least it's based on something that's actually happening, right? So for that reason, DraftKings, sports betting, going in C tier. So this is our final tier list here. At the top, we've got no gambling, the best. We've got poker below that, then blackjack and video poker in B tier below that. We've got baccarat, craps, day trading, and sports betting in C tier. Roulette in D tier, and then slots and a Powerball all the way down in F tier. Never play these games. Holy shit, for the love of God, do not play these games. Anyway, let's look at our final results here. We have $564,619,245 left from our initial $700 million total, which is a far cry from the you know billions of dollars I was expecting to make. What the fuck? We lost 135 million, I forgot a comma, $380,755 on this shit. What the hell, man? What the fuck is this? I thought you go into a casino and you make money, dude. You're not supposed to lose money. They say win big. That's part of their advertising. It's false advertisement. This is completely ridiculous. But let's talk about some standout characters. Let's, let's give up some awards out, all right? So first of all, let's talk about our best overall bot. So here we have Perrin, which I don't even think is a real name. I looked it up and I think it is the name of a Pokemon character. Not like a Pokemon, but like a character in Pokemon. I've never heard anybody have this name, but I, I don't know. It's blame the list I got the names from, man. Anyway, let's, let's recover what Perrin did. So Perrin started off by losing $12 on Baccarat. Wah, wah. And then they won $630 on Blackjack. Nice. They lost $174 on Craps. So they're still up. Then they lost $160 on Roulette. Still up. And then they won $2,500 on Slots. Lost $360 on Video Poker. And then they won $998,998 on the Lottery. Which is uh, pretty damn good. So they hit... Almost the jackpot, they just didn't match up that Powerball on the lottery. So congratulations, the total winnings to Perrin is one million dollars and one thousand one million one thousand four hundred and twenty-two dollars. So congratulations, Perrin. You are our greatest gambler, the greatest asset to us. Most of your winnings came from the lottery. You're one of the few, all right. Uh, most people lost all their fucking money on the lottery. Um, what's funny about this one is, besides blackjack, these are both F-tier forms of gambling that Perrin won at. So they are the best at playing the worst games. Very cool. All right, worst overall bot is... 
Uh, come on, man. Pick it up. Pick up the pace. Murta, which I don't even think is a name. So you deserve all the punishment you're getting your way. All right. Let's see what Murta did. They lost 69 nice dollars on Bakura. Then they lost $550 on Blackjack. Then they lost $474 on Craps. Then they lost $320 on Roulette. $820 on Slots. $700 on Video Poker. And then $994 on the Lottery. Losing us a total of $3,927. You get, you go to jail, buddy. You lost me, like, more than half of the money I gave you. This is completely ridiculous. You are the reason that we lost that 130-something million dollars. Fuck you, Murta. So, thank you all for watching. What are your conclusions here? Gambling is bad, okay? I mean, once again, I don't have to sit here and tell you. You probably already know that gambling's bad, you know? I'm not going to morally grandstand to you, but I'm just telling you, that you are most likely going to lose money, as you see here. Every game we played had a negative expected value, except for not gambling, which only had a slightly you know, negative expected value. You could get mugged, could happen. If you're going to gamble though, be responsible and be informed, right? Know the numbers, know which games are better and worse than others to play. Just, you know, be aware that you're going to probably lose money and only gamble money that you can afford to lose. Never play slots, roulette, or the lottery, especially not the fucking lottery. Holy shit, you will lose so much money playing the lottery. There's no reason to play it, and uh, coding is fun. That's another conclusion that I got. So, with that being said, thank you for coming to my TED Talk. Um, I hope you all go broke. <laughs>